first speaker uh, is uh, Professor Anne Ye, and she's going to address a topic that uh, has worried a lot of people for some time with regard to anti-CD20 uh, directed therapies. And uh, I'm looking forward to hear what she has to say. She is a paediatric neurologist, uh, another from uh, Canada, um, and we'll uh, look forward with interest to hearing what she's got to say, Anne. Okay, uh, thank you, Bill. Can everyone hear me? Everything's uh, good? Um, thank you, Bill, for that kind introduction. And I will, uh, full disclosure, I am a pediatric neurologist, but as I said to Bill just a minute ago, what, we, what I really want to talk about is the longer term use of um, B cell depleting therapies, not in the pediatric population, although I'll throw some in for information in for fun, um, but the use of these therapies in the MS population, which um, is a, very important to our practice. Um, next, okay, these are my disclosures, um, and these are my objectives. I'm going to, I know that this audience um, is very familiar with B-cell therapies, but really just to contextualize things, what I'd like to start out with is just um, touching very briefly on evidence, the duration that we've known about um, B-cell therapies in MS, and, and then to go very, very briefly into common side effects, because that segues very, uh, uh, very importantly into the long-term effects and the things that we've been thinking about all of us who are practitioners that care for people with MS, um, and, and to throw in a little bit, bit about pediatrics, not because I think that you're gonna be taking, the majority of yours are gonna be taking care of pediatric patients, but because lessons from the pediatric population do hold for adults with, who are receiving these therapies, and as well, um, because many of you will be inheriting patients that have started with therapies at a very young age. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you actually um, do care for pediatric patients? Not a, a handful, and then how many have inherited pediatric patients? Okay, so there is something of relevance in that last part, um, but I promise it's not going to be everything I talk about. So I'm going to start off by just reminding you that we weren't the first to use B-cell suppression, um, that uh, B-cell therapies originated, or B-cell suppressive therapies in the form of rituximab, um, originated, or originally were used in, in lymphomas and um, only became sort of translated over to the MS literature and to MS populations. Um, at the, in the mid-aughts, um, uh, through the publication of this seminal paper um, looking at rituximab um, in the use of, um, in, in multiple sclerosis. This was followed uh, um, by a long hiatus, but a decade later, as everyone knows, and um, as was talked about earlier this morning, um, by, the, um, by the introduction and by the publication of two seminal papers in 2017, which led to EMA and FDA approval, as everyone is aware of, uh, of ocrelizumab for relapsing and progressive MS. And then further, um, uh, emphasizing the importance of B cells. You're going to hear a lot more about B cells at the end of the day, but just further emphasizing um, the effectiveness of these therapies, of course, ofatumumab, the ofatumumab trial was published in 2020, um, resulting in um, an approval. And um, back to square one, rituximab, which is now genericized um, only last month. Uh, uh, there was a publication from the Swedish group who have been using uh, rituximab regularly for, um, for MS for many, many years, um, and finally a phase three trial that showed efficacy in relapsing MS. So we know there are multiple B-cell depleting therapies in MS, that they work, um, they are effective, and just as demonstrated um, by a graph that everyone is familiar with, that the, there is um, high efficacy in, the, in terms of re, uh, reducing relapses, but also in, um, in reducing MRI activity, which is something that we're all, as neurologists, obsessed, obsessed with these days. And so this is just a demonstration from the OPERA 1 and OPERA 2 trials, which shows a 94% fewer, uh, fewer enhancing lesions. So the drugs work. We all love to use them. Um, and um, they even work 
potentially in active uh, progressive MS with, um, with MRI endpoints that were, um, were very interesting and showed differences. Um, and, and back to the uh, rituximab trial, thinking about generic uh, drugs that are available now in, um, that are more genericized that have been used off-label for many years, we know uh, now from evidence, we all knew clinically, but from evidence is published um, that, um, that rituximab has five-fold fewer relapses than the comp active comparator dimethyl fumarate um, in the Swedish trial. This is uh, important for regulatory approval um, and for um, getting coverage, of course, as we all know. So um, this is really uh, uh, to set the stage to say that um, these therapies are here. They are working. Uh, they, they appear to work. And, and that um, more and more we are relying on these therapies, but are nervous, as Bill pointed out, are nervous about how long we can use these. Because as everyone in this room knows, before neurologists pulled this therapy into their arm armamentarium, this, this therapy was actually only used as induction for, uh, in rheumatology or as, induction, and as an induction therapy in lymphoma. So in fact, the period uh, or the idea of sustaining use of this therapy is only a more recent phenomenon. Um, and, um, has, uh, and, and this is really the question that comes to mind. We know also that this is uh, this this medication. For those of you that practice um, in MS only, you may not be seeing these patients. For the majority of people that um, take care of neuroinflammatory conditions, we know that um, this is used. I use it very frequently. It's probably the most common medication uh, class of medications that I prescribe now. Um, in that it is, um, there is an agent that's approved for NMOSD, and as well it's used in NMDA receptor encephalitis and a, a host of other neuroinflammatory conditions. Um, this is really just to demonstrate how many anti-CD19, CD20 therapies are either approved or in the works, um, and how many, and, and the fact that there are other conditions that we take care of that are um, under that umbrella. So, Getting back to uh, the issue of what to, what to do and the, the big thing that worries everyone, I take care of children. Um, and I, I, I'm going to guess that many of you in the audience take care of people that are quite young. We talked, uh, Dr. Dobson talked about pregnancy earlier today, which um, puts and, and we know epidemiologically, MS occurs in people at a very young age. This is a 14-year-old child. Now, most of you are not taking care of people who are 14, but that child is a child that I would take care of and, and is not much different from the 18-year-old that would be presenting, 18 to 20-year-old that would be presenting, in terms of the duration of period of time that they would need to receive therapy for MS in the absence of a cure. So in a patient like this, and I think someone made a comment earlier during, the, um, during Dr. Dobson's uh, uh, talk about active disease, we in neurology have moved towards efficacious, highly efficacious therapies because we know they make a difference down the line. Any treatment makes a difference, as Dr. Dobson pointed out. But highly efficacious therapies in real life studies have clearly uh, have, have been demonstrated to make a difference down the line. So starting in a patient like this, and you guys all see that spinal cord disease, which, um, which many years of studies have demonstrated to link with future disability, I think I and many others in the audience would be thinking, well, I'm going to go with a highly efficacious agent as first line. Um, but in the conversation with the family and the conversation in our own minds, what will come up is, how will this medication affect my patient or me? and my family member, and, and that's where we, in my practice, spend a great deal of time, and the majority of our time. 
So what are the short-term side effects? Everyone in this room is aware of the short-term side effects. Regardless of ocrelizumab being a humanized monoclonal antibody, as you can see from the, um, from the New England Journal 2017 paper, um, adverse uh, events including um, infusion-related reactions are high. They're consistently high in the OPERA-1, OPERA-2, and OPERETA studies in about a third of patients. Um, uh, no surprise, and no surprise to this audience. Um, but importantly, the questions that Bill indicated, you know, at the introduction to this talk are, you know, are there going to be more infections? And we worried about this a lot during COVID. Are there going to be more infections? Are there going to be more catastrophes that I'm causing by, by wiping out the B cell population in, in these patients? And in this study, as everyone's aware, at the short term, um, there was no signal from infection or neoplasm. But the concern really came with the progressive MS trial that was published in the same edition of the New England Journal, which also pointed to the same uh, sort of neighborhood of infusion-related reactions, but an imp a, a, a question of whether neoplasm was seen was going to be turn out to be an important and um, terrible signal um, in these patients because, as you can see here, there were no patients with breast cancer in the placebo group, whereas there were four in this. And I, I, I set this up for you so that you can remember the kinds of things that um, have plagued people um, in relation to the use of these therapies. Because although there was not much more signal in infection, neoplasms um, were on people's minds. So what does happen longer term? Do we have more evidence? Well, since that, those seminal trials were published, there is more information. But I'm going to give you um, some information, historical information, from rheumatologic groups that have used the medications for uh, quite a long time so that we can contextualize it, um, and then and talk a little bit about um, the uh, the important studies that have been published looking at longer term effects. But I'm going to start out with immunoglobulin suppression. And um, this is um, something that is obvious, um, but um, because we as neurologists did not use these therapies before, we didn't really uh, have a sense of when to test immunoglobulins, whether it mattered, because, of course, um, you're suppressing the B cells, you might expect a change in immunoglobulin levels. And so this is an older paper from 2016 from the Swedish group, and as I, you know, reminding you that rituximab is the most commonly used agent in Sweden, and, you know, that study showed 53% of, um, of MS therapies that were being prescribed with rituximab in, you know, five years ago, and even more now. Um, um, so in this, um, in this study, there was an average follow-up of 23 months. And um, what I want to share with you is uh, the immunoglobulin story. Now, this is potentially less, uh, less relevant in the adult uh, population, but, um, but I, I want to use it to highlight some differences that we might see. Um, and so in this study, as you can see, um, IgG levels drifted down through time to a number of uh, about 8.5 grams per liter um, over the course. This is a study that had some, a small number of patients that had follow-up of um, uh, maybe up to five to six years with, um, um, and these are infusion numbers up to, uh, so a very, very small number, but up to about five or six years, but the majority had, you know, just a couple of years. But we see that there was a drift down of IgG levels. But importantly, how, how, how much of this is clinically significant? So 3% had IgG levels below the reference, ra reference range at some point. Not a big number, but enough to say, oh, well, maybe I should be looking at those IgG levels. What does this mean for infection? I'm going to come back to that in a minute because I want to um, just let you know about the longer term um, specter, does the, does the line keep going down through time if you 
keep giving this medication for 7, 10, 20 years? We don't know, but we do have evidence from the, uh, this paper that was published in 2021 looking at 11 clinical trials related to ocrelizumab. Okay, so that is every single patient that was in an ocrelizumab trial, um, starting from the phase two trials, for up to seven years of use, and a uh, very nice N, 5,600. Okay, so a big number, um, and really answering some of the important questions. We're gonna talk about neoplasm in a minute, okay? And, and so similar to the, uh, the study that was published in 2016 by the Swedish group, you see the IgG levels drifting down. And, interest, and interestingly or importantly, um, the, um, the authors divided this between the oratorio and the opera studies just to ask the question of, is there a difference in progressive MS versus relapsing MS? Um, and um, the answer is no. And the interesting or, um, I guess, reassuring thing is that the number that they came out with, as those IgG levels drifted down, was about the same as in the 2016 study. So immunoglobulin levels drop in the adult population. A small percentage will have a, a um, hypogammaglobulinemia. But I want you to be aware, and this is the pediatric part, I promise this is of relevance to you, this may be age dependent. Um, so when, when I uh, talk to adult colleagues about um, hypogammaglobulinemia, and when I started using Rituxx, so I based a lot of my decisions on what was known in adult, uh, um, adult literature, and what, I, what we found within our population, was that almost every child that I treated um, had hypogammaglobulinemia. And in fact, if you look at this cohort, this is a, a nice paper from 2019, which demonstrates basically what we've seen as well, um, is that in autoimmune CNS diseases, when you use rituximab in the pediatric population, I'll um, highlight this, the dark part of the bar is persistent hypogammaglobulinemia, greater than six months, and the gray part of the bar is transient, less than six months. And you can see just um, in this small cohort that not only do more than half of the did more than half of the patients in the cohort experience hypogammaglobulinemia, um, but it was especially pronounced in CNS diseases. Why is that? I'm going to take you to the next slide to, to think about that. And, and this is another large study. Of, um, of children treated with rituximab, 200 uh, children treated with rituximab. Again, I remind you, um, uh, many people in medicine have been at this for longer than we have um, uh, in using rituximab for either prolonged periods or for induction therapies. And so this collection included all takers um, of uh, kids on rituximab. And I'm going to point this out because this may have relevance um, for the adult population, especially maybe that 3% that has low or hypo um, gamma globulinemia, that one in 25 in this pediatric population were found to have primary immunodeficiency or an immune dysregulatory syndrome um, that was uncovered by rituximab. So um, this is really for you guys to think about in terms of do you, if you have an especially bad MS patient, an especially youngish MS patient with very active disease who um, develops neutropenia and hypogammaglobulinemia on Rituxx, remember, check it before that you start your Rituxx or your ocrelizumab or ofatumumab, whatever you decide to use, um, because that may give you a signal as to and a, a different mechanism um, or a immune dysregulation that may have, uh, may associate with the MS. Okay, um, and importantly, in the pediatric population, um, many started out with low IgG, but, um, but almost half in this large collection ended up with a, um, a decreased um, IgG and a quarter in comparison to um, you know, that 
maybe 3% that at one point in the adult population ended up with persistent um, hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, and, and looking at, um, at other pediatric cohorts, this is a, a cross-sectional study of um, children with um, different kinds of autoimmune uh, inflammatory CNS disorders. Um, and out of 120 some odd patients, about 20% also had hypogammaglobulinemia. So important for that, but also important for you to think about as, as you are using these therapies more, think about that baseline IgG or immunoglobulin that might give you a signal as to whether or not there is some immune dysregulation going on. Okay, what about infection and malignancy? All this talk about hypogammaglobulinemia it doesn't really matter clinically unless there is a secondary effect like infection. And um, the good news is, based on rheumatologic literature in, um, with rituximab that, um, that was up to 11 years follow-up um, with 3,500 patients, there is no, uh, no significant signal for infection, okay? And that's with rituximab. Moving on to that larger study that I talked about with the 11 clinical trials, long-term follow-up data, seven years follow-up data, you can see that, um, that the yearly rates of infection here for relapsing MS for all exposures up to year seven remains virtually the same through time, which is good news, and um, remains low. It's a little higher in the progressive group um, but still is fairly stable. And the message there is that the inf infection rates are relatively stable through time, and they don't increase the longer that you stay at least to seven years. And we have to remember that we are, our proposition is to treat these patients for longer than seven years, so there's a lot more that we have to learn. So what about malignancy? Back to that signal that everyone was wringing their hands over from the progressive group. Are there more malignancies or are there not? And what we can see here that the overall uh, malignancy rate in, um, in uh, oh, this is a, the breast cancer graph, the, um, the breast cancer rate, which was higher in the uh, progressive uh, group, um, remains fairly stable. And you might say, okay, yeah, the breast cancer rate is um, at, uh, you know, uh, 0.4 per 100 person years. But, and, and that the, the female breast the sorry, that was the regular cancer rate, and the breast cancer rate is pretty low and it remains low. But what does that mean on a population basis? Because you might be still fixating on that finding from the uh, progressive trial. And so what the um, investigators on this, uh, uh, on this study demonstrated, which I um, think is a really helpful thing, is they took the Danish registry and they took another population-based registry and asked the question of, well, are the rates that we saw in this population, the Danish MS registry, okay, are the rates that we saw in, this popula in, in our population any different? And um, the reassuring news is that the malignancy rates were no different from population, um, popu from population using these registries, okay? So it seems that the original neoplasm signal that came out in the progressive trial is probably um, not a true signal, okay? This is only seven years follow-up, and I keep saying that, but um, it, um, what we're doing sort of reminds me of where people in the cancer literature were about, um, about 15, 20 years ago in asking about long-term effects, okay? PML, we all carry, care about PML, and I just need to mention this because it has been listed as a, uh, or it has been described, and um, what I, I want to emphasize is that there have been nine cases, there were nine cases reported in a poster uh, a few years ago with eight as carryover cases, um, and, and that if you look more broadly at the rheumatologic literature, 
um, that PML um, was found as well in nine cases, nine must be a magic number, um, in a very large um, group of rheumatoid arthritis and granulomatous, uh, uh, gran granulomatosis with um, polyangiitis with a, um, with a rate of 2.56 per 100,000 in treated rheumatoid arthritis patients. And so PML is deemed a very low risk, um, at least according to the literature that's available to, to, to date. And I know it's something that we all worry about no matter um, what therapy we're using. Okay, what about children? One last little slide about children, um, just to remind everyone, well, there have been no cases of PML reported, but this is another um, study looking at long-term use in nephrotic syndrome, again, borrowing from our colleagues that have been using these therapies for quite some time, uh, with a follow-up, um, you know, up to seven years, um, which again showed significant hypogamma globulinemia, IgG, with neutropenia, and I want to remind everyone that neutropenia is a potential issue um, in this population, and that in the patients that I found with neutropenia and um, persistent immunoglobulin deficiency, those are the ones you want to worry about whether or not there is some sort of primary immunodysregulation or immune dis dysfunction going on. Um, uh, and, um, and in their population, they found significant hypo-IgG, um, meaning very low, associated with um, infection to be 11%. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up. That was a, uh, a summary of um, what, what is known to date about longer term use, and I use the word longer term, not long, because we're gonna be at this for quite some time. We've got other B, you're gonna hear more about B cell therapies later in the afternoon. Um, we are gonna be at this for a long time, and um, that the seven-year data suggests that things are safe. The, uh, the oncologic signal does not seem to have been borne out, um, and that hypogammon globulinemia is something that you really want to watch out for, so please check that, um, that immunoglobulin level at baseline. Check the neutrophils, um, because um, what happened to me early on when I was using um, these therapies is that I ended up not knowing if I had caused an immunodeficiency, uh, converted a child to having immunodeficiency, or if that was a, uh, a start to it. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Hopefully we have some, a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and this is, um, I, I put this picture up to make everyone think about sunny days because this is a very somber day, and I appreciate all of the hard work that the organizers have put into um, making this day work despite the, um, the challenging and sad situation. Thank you so much for your attention.